are excited about today. Again, this is week two of our Now Showing series. Um, again, I love this series because it's such a great reminder that truth is truth. And that's the beautiful thing is that we take popular movies, movies that we love, and we're going to pull out illustrations that point towards a truth in Scripture. We're not preaching the movies. We're just using them as illustrations for what God's already saying and what God is already doing in our life. Today, our movie is Castaway. Anybody seen Castaway? Come on, Tom Hanks. Uh, I, this is an incredible one. It's probably his best movie because if you can act with a volleyball as your only counterpart for like two hours, good for you. Um, but the second thing, too, is this story, it, it, it paints such a picture of the decisions and the struggles that we as believers face in our walk with Jesus. It really does. Because I've learned this to be true. No matter the season of our life, whether it's a smooth season, it's just easy going, or it's challenging, whether it seems completely painful, or there's a lot of hope in it, no matter the season of our life, I've learned this about God. God desires to lead us further than we've ever been so that we can experience more of him than ever before. This is the same truth in every season of your life. Whether you're a new believer, whether you've known Jesus for five minutes, five years, 15 or 50, it's still true. In every season of life, God wants to take you further than ever before so that you can experience more of him than ever before. That's the journey we go on, but it's not always an easy journey. It's a journey in which we're gonna have to make choices and take steps. And because of that, God gives us examples through men and women in scripture. From throughout the entirety of the Bible, we see examples of men and women who have faithfully gone down this journey. From starting with Abraham all the way up through Moses, through, through Jonah as he's fighting God's call and is swallowed by a whale because he refuses to step into his promise and then spit back out so that he can walk the right path. All the way into the New Testament to see the disciples Jesus chose and called and the apostles that came after. One of the ones we see in the New Testament is a man named Paul. Now, Paul's journey is interesting. It's a little dramatic, but it paints a pretty real picture of where we find ourselves to. Uh, just stay with me on that. The, the reality is that Paul, as dramatic as his past was, his past was lived chasing the wrong thing. Anybody ever chased the wrong thing before? You ever get caught up in changing the wrong pursuit, chasing the wrong pursuit, chasing the wrong person, chasing the wrong desire? This is where Paul was. Paul was stuck with this desire that Jesus was not the son of God and that the church was wicked. And so his ultimate desire was to bring to destruction the church. That was his ultimate goal. As I said, it's a little dramatic of a tale, okay? But it's similar. It's still the concept of chasing something that we shouldn't be chasing, being stuck in this cloud of confusion. And so Paul finds himself there and he's actually on the road to Damascus where he encounters Jesus. He's on the road to Damascus, and he encounters Jesus, and Jesus changes his life forever. Now he stops being the greatest opponent of the church and the greatest proponent for the church. He, he now goes on to write three-fourths of the New Testament and plant churches and, be, and move forward the name of Jesus throughout much of the Mediterranean. And it's an incredible journey we see him go on. And so most of the letters we see in the New Testament, most of the books, these are letters that Paul wrote to people, to churches, to locations, encouraging them, sometimes challenging them and charging them as to what it looks like to live a life for Jesus. One of those is the book of Philippians. Philippians is a letter he wrote to the church of a place called Philippi. He was connected to these men and women closely. And in chapter 3, we see Paul, he's writing to them with this hope that they will learn that there is a priceless value in knowing who Jesus is in your life. In knowing what Jesus has called you to and what he wants from you. And he says this, in Philippians 3, starting in verse 12, he begins, he says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. I love that he starts with stating this position of humility. He's like, listen to me, I'm with you. Myself, Pastor Mark, anyone on this platform is in the same position. We're with you in the journey. We have not obtained this perfection. We have not reached the goal. We are pursuing it just like you. I preach best because I'm preaching at myself. Nine times out of 10, I'm saying it to myself. I'm looking in a mirror when I'm talking about this. This is what Paul's saying. He's like, I haven't obtained this. Don't make the mistake of thinking that. He says, but... Even though I haven't obtained it, but I press on. Everybody say, press on. He says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, 
But I focus on one thing. Everybody say one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me. He says, I press on. Now, this isn't just like a casual stroll through his life. The, the, the language he uses, the context he's using, when he says, I press on, he's saying, this is a passionate, violent pursuit. Like, this is me full steam running over everybody and everything I need to to try to obtain this. It's not some casual desire. This is the pursuit of my life. He says, I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. It's kind of a tongue twister, I know. This is the essence of what he's saying. He says, I'm chasing the purpose and the promise for which Jesus saved my life. This is what he's saying. He says, what I'm pressing on for is to receive the purpose and the promise that Jesus saved me to receive. And in case you've ever struggled with what purpose is in life, I'm about to tell you. Like, this is the great answer that you're looking for. And it's a lot simpler than you think. Our purpose to breathe as a believer in Jesus is that we would know his name, follow him, and help others to know his name. That's our purpose. It's that simple. Our purpose is to receive the love of Jesus, to reflect the love of Jesus in a way that people will receive the love of Jesus. That's it. So when he says, this is what I press on to receive, he says, I press on this journey that we call discipleship, which is me following Jesus by becoming more like him through faith and obedience. This is my journey. What he's saying I have not obtained is that I am not like Jesus yet. <laughs> says, I haven't obtained that. I have not fulfilled that yet, but I press on. I press on by leaving the past behind and focusing on what's ahead. Our promise is that we might know him, live like him, and make him known. And the promise is that he will be with us, provide for us, and grant us an eternity with him. This is what we press on towards. What we're about to learn from Paul and what we're about to learn from the clip of our movie is that pressing on requires some difficult decisions. It requires some choices that aren't always comfortable for us to make. See, in our movie Castaway, we have our main character's name is Chuck Nolan. Not Chuck Norris, Chuck Nolan, okay? Chuck Nolan was a man who lived to the letter of his calendar. He lived by the clock and by the letter of the rule. This is what he did. And as a FedEx operator, he was traveling across the ocean when his plane lost control, lost power, and crashed into the middle of the ocean. And, and big, big breaker here, it's called Castaway because he is now cast away on an island, okay? Not spoiling a whole lot, but he goes down and then he's found himself abandoned and alone, deserted on an island. And he has a four year journey we see him walk through in the movie in which he faces depression and difficult decisions about what to do next in his journey. I love at the beginning, he, he's having this debate with Wilson, his inner doubt, his inner mind. And he says, The reality is, I would rather die out there than stay here any longer. I've realized there's something better away from here, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to go down that pursuit. There's a similar lesson that we learned, and it's the reminder that Paul gives us that pursuing God's promise requires us to leave our current place. Pursuing God's promise is going to require you to leave your current place. That's what he had to come to the understanding is, I'm done with what the island has for me, but I realize I'm going to have to leave it to go where I want to go. That's a difficult thing that we face. That's what makes the decision of following Jesus more difficult than it really should be. Because the action of following God is, means that we leave something else behind. In order to get where we want to go, we often have to do and go through what we don't want to. This is what Chuck Nolan battles. If you see that scene as the island where he's been held captive for so long is fading off in the distance, you see an emotion come over him. He struggles to let go of it. You would think it would be easy for, for him to let go of the thing that he struggled with, this thing that held him as a slave and a captive, alone and isolated. But there's something comfortable about a common place. Whether it's a hurtful place or a good place, there's something comfortable about it sometimes, and it makes it difficult for us to take the journey and leave it. Sometimes it's hard to do what we want to do, even though we know we need to do it. Amen? Amen. My kids struggle with this often. There's things they want to do, but when we explain to them what it's going to take, eh, 
You don't really know. For one, is there's often we'll be downstairs, we'll be watching TV or playing a game, and then one of them will decide they want something, and they'll begin to talk to us. And for example, it's usually a blanket or a pillow, or for Reagan, it's like his favorite stuffed animal named Scrappy. He'll be like, Dad, I want Scrappy. I'm like, all right, where's Scrappy? It's like, he's in my room. And he's like, can you go get him? I'm like, no, no. You can walk your little God-given legs up the stairs, and you can get Scrappy. But if it's dark, he doesn't want to go up there because it's dark. If he's tired, he doesn't want to get up because he's tired. If he's cold, it's because he doesn't want to leave the comfort of his blanket on the couch. So we'll have a debate and we'll have a conversation. And after a few minutes of those deep puppy eyes looking at me sadly in my face, my dad heart breaks down and I look at him as he asks, Dad, we go get it for me? And with all the love and grace that I have, I look and say, no. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean. But there's a lesson he's got to learn, even at an early age, and that's that if there's something you want, you've got to be willing to take the necessary steps to obtain it. If there's something from God that we want, a promise to obtain, a place to go to, you have to be willing to take the steps. God will do the impossible to get you there, but the possible is you taking a step. It's not as difficult as we make it out to be sometimes, but yet it's a struggle. This is why he says, I press on, and so I focus on the one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I've got to leave this place to get to that place. I've got to leave here to get to there. There's two types of places I think God often pulls us away from. The first is the obvious one, and that's that he often calls us to leave hurtful places. These painful seasons of our life. This is where we find ourselves confined and wrestling to a sin or a struggle in our life. Maybe we find ourselves in an abusive relationship, one that doesn't bring glory to him and it's outside of the bounds that he's set for us. And he's calling us to step away from that. Maybe it's an addiction or a struggle or a habit or hang up that he says, this is not good for you. This serves no purpose of value in your life. I need you to step away. Maybe it's a season of hurt and hate that we're holding on to because we can't bring ourselves to forgive someone because of what they've done in our life. These are hurtful but obvious places. These are places that when we find ourselves there, God looks and says, listen, I want to take you from here to there. I've got something for you. I've got a place of peace, a place of surrender, a place of of, of joy for you. But you've got to be willing to leave here. The sad thing is even those obvious places are difficult to leave. Because, again, there's comfort over consistency. When you've set in a hurt for the last four years of your life, it's hard to leave that hurt behind. You find yourself not knowing how to sleep without that pain. Not knowing how to be in a healthy relationship because you've never known one. And so you just figure out a way to suffer peacefully through the pain. This is what our character had done. He had found a way to suffer through the island and just given up hope that there was anything better. Until that day, and then he saw a glimpse of what could be. And he had to make the decision if he would be willing to take the necessary steps or not. It's the reminder that God's desire is always to lead us further than we've ever been before. So that we can experience more of him than ever before. Where do you need to leave today? Is it a hurtful place, an obvious one? Or is it less obvious? Paul was in a hurtful place. Paul's life was about hurt and pain. It was about bringing to destruction. The first Christian martyr we see in Acts 7 was murdered at his feet. God wanted to call him out of a hurtful place and into a place of healing, in a place where he could help people and push the gospel forward instead of hinder it. Those are the obvious ones. But I think too many times in the church, it's easy to focus on the hurting because there are so many of us. But what about that season of our life, as fleeting as it may be at times, where we're good? What about that season we find ourselves in where we think, God, I'm actually good. My marriage isn't in shambles. We're healthy. We're growing. My kids are as good as kids could be. My finances are in order, so I'm finally giving in the way I should be giving. I'm serving with my free time. I'm helping those who need help. God, I'm good. Like, I'm done, right? This is where we remember God's desire is always to lead us further than we've ever been before so that we could experience more of him than ever before. A good place doesn't mean it's the place we stay. This is what I love about a quick story of a man named Elisha. Elisha was a young man who we find in in 1 Kings 19. We know very little to nothing about this young man until we meet him. 
And we encounter him through a man named Elijah. Okay, I know it's about to get confusing, so we're going we're gonna to simplify it. Everybody okay with that? So Elijah, he's the older prophet. We're going to call him E1. Everybody okay with that? He's E1. He's the first. Okay, then we have Elisha, and he's going to be... No, Elisha. Why would he be E2? I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're going to do E1 and E2. Is this okay? We're following this, all right? It's a little easier. So Elijah, which is E2, 2, two Elijah, 1. You said 1. I got myself confused. <laughs> Elijah, the older one, the original, the OG, E1, was a prophet of God. He came to a point of frustration, and God finally came to a place of saying, I'm going to tell you who you're going to pass the torch on to. It's a young man named Elisha, E2. So he sends him to go encounter Elisha. Now, this is where we find out all we know about him. From what we can see in the passage, he seems to have been a son of, of a family who had means. He seems to be a farmer. He seemed to be a good man since God was willing to pass on the torch of his prophet to the people to him. He was, seemed to be a good son based on what we see doing for his family and community. And in all generality, he seemed to have a pretty peaceful life. A good place. But look at what happens. In verse 19, it says, So Elijah, E1, went and found E2, son of Saphat, plowing a field. This is where we see as a farmer. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field. Then Elisha was plowing the 12th team, and Elijah, E1, went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. This sounds weird, but it wasn't. This was him passing the torch of his authority and power over to E2. And E2 immediately knew what this meant. And so it says, he left his oxen standing there and ran after E1 and said to him, first let me go and kiss my father and my mother goodbye, then I will go with you. E1 replied, go back, but think about what I've done to you. I love this phrase. It's actually an idiom. It really means do what you want. He's saying, do what you want with this, because I'm not doing this. God's doing this. I'm not calling you. I'm not the one bringing you out of this. This is God's doing, so do what you want with it. So this is what E2 decides to do. Verse 21. So Elisha, our young man, E2, returned to his oxen, slaughtered them, then used the wood from the plow to build a fire and to roast them. Then he passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. See, it's easy to see the hurtful places that God calls us out of. But what about the good places? There's good places and good seasons in our life where God looks and says, it's time to move. I understand this is good, but I've got something great. I know the journey is going to be tough. I know it doesn't make sense why I would disturb you, but it's going to be worth it. See, sometimes God doesn't just move us from the hurtful. He levels up our good. He says, I know you're doing well. I know this is a great moment, a great season for you, but I want to level it up for you. I heard this quote the other day, and I thought it was fitting. He says, there is always another level up. There's more grace, more light, more generosity and compassion. There's more to shed, and there's more to grow. He says, there's always another level up. I, I beg us all not to make the mistake of limiting growth with Jesus as leaving sin behind. Sometimes growing in our walk with Jesus as a disciple is just as much about embracing the good as it is discarding the bad. Sometimes that's the bigger step, the more difficult one. It's easy to know the filth we need to get rid of, but how do I let go of what's good in order to obtain what's great? I'm comfortable here. I see God working here. I feel God here. How do I level up this? Maybe it's just a new season. Again, God's desire is always to take you further than you've ever been before so that you can experience more of him than ever before. Maybe your marriage is in a really healthy season. So God's obviously not calling you. He's never calling you to leave that. But maybe he wants you to level it up. Maybe you're going to love your wife more to the point to where now your kids understand how to love a spouse. Maybe you're going to love your wife more, your spouse more, and that means that you're going to take another couple alongside you and help teach them how to do the same. Maybe your finances are at a place where your generosity is at another level. Maybe it still has another level. Maybe that other level is that you take the stories of how God's blessed your generosity and you teach it to other people so that they learn what it looks like to be generous. 
Maybe you've got a servant sacrificial heart and you're giving your time and your energy, your talents back to the Lord. Maybe the level up is that you find someone and you bring them along with you so that they learn what it looks like too. God always wants to take you further than you've ever been before so that you can experience more of him than ever before. When you've gotten to the place you need to be, you're in heaven. It ain't here. I'll never forget both of my grandparents that died over the last year and a half, two years, both died past the age of 90. My, my grandpa, my dad's dad, who, who had no use of his body really because of strokes, would, would, would talk to us pretty honestly about his frustration with God as to why am I still here. And his own response that he could come to was simply, God must not be done. My grandma, who led Bible studies her entire life, was battling dementia at age 94 before she passed away. And her only thought was, I wish I could still be teaching because if I'm alive, I must have something to do. We're never done. Even in our good places, God wants to level us up. Following Jesus in this journey is the constant leaving one place in order to pursue another. Sometimes pursuing tomorrow means taking hold of healing and peace because of salvation and surrender to the Lord. Sometimes what we achieve tomorrow is blessings and favor that come from more obedience and faith. It's just a matter of the season. But the season is the same in the sense that God always wants to take you further than you've ever been so that you can experience more of him than ever before. That never changes. But it's never easy. Because of that, we must learn how to fight the temptation to remain in our current position. We must fight the temptation to remain or return to our current position. It's easy to look and see the invitation of God saying, I want to take you further. I want to level you up in this area of your life. But it's another thing to actually take this step out. For us, when, when we about twice a year hit like a really healthy desire in our life, um, where we want to like lose weight and get healthy, anybody else, like once, twice a year, you know, it's usually after, at the first of the year because that's what we do. And then it's sometimes a couple months before summer when you realize you don't want to be seen, okay? <laughs> There's some contrast there. Now for us, I have to just remove all temptation. So when we decide we want to eat healthy in our home, what, what do we do? Get rid of everything. Oh, we just got to get it out of our eyesight. Now, we have different perspectives. Christine throws it away. I take a weekend and try to eat it all because I don't want to waste it. <laughs> However, we have the same purpose, the same thought. I want to remove the temptation. I don't want it to be easy to fall back on. I want it to be where I have to dig that gummy bear out of the trash if I'm going to eat it. I'm not going to talk about if we've ever gone there. You don't even know that. But this is why Paul speaks so dramatically, saying you got to forget it. Don't carry it. Don't hold on to the trophies, forget it, and focus on what's to come. Sometimes, it's, again, it's not always the bad. Sometimes we live so much desiring the good old days that we miss the great days of tomorrow. Don't allow the victory of yesterday to keep you from experiencing the bigger victory of tomorrow. He says, forget what's behind you. Be like Elisha. Burn it. Give it to the altar of the Lord. Hand it away. He was so willing to pursue this that it says he slaughtered the, the oxen and then used the, 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 the cart as the plow, as the firewood to cook it and then gave it all away. There was nothing to return to. He was all in. And Paul says, I press on. That's the level of intensity in which we press on. I'm a thousand percent in. Nothing's going to stop this. I'm going after what Jesus wants for me. There's one last clip, and I, I want to save our time to, to, to dive into the, to the word a little more, so I'll just explain it. Um, as Chuck Nolan is going into the sea a little further and further, hoping for the possibility of being saved, he comes to this place where he, he wakes up, looks over, and his friend, his, his companion, Wilson, this is my Wilson, you like my Wilson? Wilson, he's a little creepier, to be honest, but he wakes up to find Wilson floating off. The current's taking Wilson away from the boat. And we find ourselves in this dramatic scene where he, he takes hold of a rope from the raft and he dives into the ocean. And he's swimming, trying to get a hold of and trying to reach Wilson. 
And he comes to this difficult decision where he has to pick. He, he lets go of the rope holding on to the raft, his safety, his security, what's saving his life. He lets go of it for just a moment, and he has this debate. Do I chase after Wilson, or do I hold on to my safety? Do I chase after the thing that represents the past, my four years of solitude and suffering on the island, or do I keep holding on to the thing leading me to a new place? It's a difficult moment, but he finally just allows Wilson to just float on away. For so many of us, that's the season we're in. We're looking at the things of our past, and we're looking at the things of the promise of tomorrow, trying to decide which one do I chase. Understand this, what you chase today will determine where you stand tomorrow. What you chase today will determine where you stand tomorrow. If you chase the things of the past, you'll find yourself there again. But if you chase the things of God, if you chase your purpose, which is to know him, live like him so that he is known by others, then his promises will come to you. We're not just chasing the promise, we're chasing the person who gives the promise. That's the life we live. But we can't do it by holding on to the past. This is why Paul says so dramatically to forget the things behind and look forward to the things ahead. He had to let go of Wilson. It had to happen because that was too strong of a reminder. He would have sacrificed the peace and the safety of tomorrow to hold on to a picture of the past. You have to understand this. The journey is never as easy as it is necessary, but the promise we pursue is worth it. The promise is always worth the pursuit. God never says it will be easy, but he promises it will be worth everything we have. We see this lived out through people throughout scripture. We'll close with this. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, the author of Hebrews takes time in chapter 11. Go home, read it. We're not always going to be able to cover everything in here, so go read it. Dive into it. See what God does through it. In Hebrews 11, he walks through the men and women who are like the greatest testimonies of faith. It's like the hall of fame of faith. He walks through all these men and women who have gone before us, and he's looking to them as an example of what is possible if we say yes to pursuing the promise of God. He says this in verse 1 of 12. He says, therefore, in other words, because of these people, because we are surrounded by such a huge crowd or cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off everything that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, let us run with endurance the race set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, who because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside the Lord God. When it comes to pursuing God, there's three super quick things that I want you to understand. This is what the author of Hebrews points to. It's what we see through Paul's message. It's what we see through Elisha's testimony of his life. There's three things you need to do. Look up, let go, look up, and lay hold. Same with me. Say, let go, look up, and lay hold. First thing he says is what we do is we... We strip off every weight, and then we let go of the sin. I love that he says it's two things. He says we strip off the weight and especially the sin. He's talking about two different things. This is the, the, the hurtful place and the good place that we, we have to leave sometimes. He says sometimes there is sin that, that easily and obviously trips us up and entangles us. That you've got to set down, and maybe that's where you are today. There is sin that is running your life. There's sin that is ruining your life that you are holding on to. It's a hurt, it's a hate, it's a pain, it's an addiction or a struggle, whatever it might be. And that's what's keeping you from moving forward in this race. He says you've got to lay that down, but you also have to strip off the weight. Sometimes it's just the weight of not being willing to move. <laughs> the weight of our comfort, of our current place, keeps us from wanting to move forward. What is it today that you need to let go of? What is it today that God wants you to level up? 
He says you've got to let it go and then you've got to look up. This is the common thing we see between the authors in in Hebrews' message and Paul's. They both said, keep your eyes on Jesus, the champion and the creator of our faith. He's the reason we can even do this. He's the reason we can have this journey and take this pursuit. He is the reason. He is the cause. He is the creator, and he has perfected the journey for us. He says, when you let go of the things that are hindering you, look to him. Keep your focus on the Father. Keep your eyes on him. He's the one who will get you there. He's the one who has walked the path that you need to follow. Don't worry about what's behind you. Don't worry about what's to your right or to your left. Ignore the distractions and look at the Savior. He says, let go, look up, and then you will lay hold. He says, because of the joy set before him, Jesus endured the pain and shame of the cross. And now he is seated next to the throne of God. There is a promise worth the pursuit. There is something worth what we have to surrender. Sometimes the promise you're desiring to have in your life stands behind the sacrifice you're not willing to make. Are you willing to let it go in order to lay hold of something better? This morning, my prayer is just that God would speak directly to where you are. Some of you, it's the hurtful place that you need to leave. Some of you, you're in a good place, but you're struggling with frustration because of people around you, or you're struggling because of just comfort, saying, but what more could I do? I've done enough. Don't allow those things to cloud the reality that God's desire is always to take you further than you've ever been so that you can know more of him than ever before. That's always the desire. So we should always be looking, God, what's the next step? What can I level up? Where can I go from here? What's the great that I don't want to miss? This is what we preach as a church. This is why we believe in the areas that we push with small groups and having people walk with you and help disciple you along that journey. This is why we believe in the student ministry and allowing your students, your teenagers to be loved on and shown what it looks like to live a life following Jesus in their context. This is why we believe children's ministry is so important for the exact same reasons. This is the heartbeat of our church that we want you to know who God is to let go of what you need to in order to find freedom through him so that you can discover your purpose and then go make a difference. This is the journey and the journey never ends, but it is worth everything that God will demand from us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the call in our life. We thank you that you give us a purpose. We thank you that that purpose is that we may know you, live like you so that others may know you. We thank you, Lord, that you call us to a place where we can know you personally as our Lord and Savior so that we can find freedom in our life. Father, I pray that some people, that's where they're at. That's their move this morning. That's the step they need to take is that they've never actually surrendered their life to you as their Lord and Savior. I pray today would be the day. It's as simple as where they are sitting, just praying this, saying, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I know that I have made mistakes. I know you died on the cross to forgive those mistakes. Jesus, forgive my sin, save my life, and be my Lord. Scripture says that if we confess that with our mouth and believe it in our heart, that we will be saved. And for some of you, that's the step. For others, it's understanding and getting a hold of what it is you need to let go. Maybe there's an area of your life that is hindering you, that is preventing you, it's sin, it's hurtful. And you need to let it go. You need to lay it at the altar. Remember, it's been forgiven. Now it's time to be forgotten. Or maybe it's just you need to level up. It's not that you're in a bad place. You're in a good place. But understand that God's desire is always to take you further than you've ever been before. So that you may experience more of him than ever before. Father, we love you. We thank you for the journey. We thank you for the call. We thank you for the comfort and the promise that you are with us every step of the way. Lord Jesus, we love you. It's in your son's name we faithfully pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, as you, you can give God a hand this morning. Come on, he's been working all day. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. 
And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.